guide your journey into Cabernet Sauvignon magnificence. Hi, welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine. And this week, as well as meeting some top winemakers, I'm doing a bit of shopping. This is my local pick and pay, and I'm about to head overseas for a few weeks. I want to take some really good South African wine with me. And so I thought I'd do a bit of shopping. However, it's proving rather difficult because there is an enormous selection and there is a restriction on just how much wine I can take with me. So I'm hoping for some inspiration as I make my way through a selection, which might take you by surprise as I look just straight up here, a couple of my favorites, the Hot Muscop Red Blend from Dele Graaf, the uh, classic Mirlas Rubicon, which is always a winner, Constantia Glen, both the three and the five, winning a lot of awards at the moment, uh, the Bosch and Bell's Nicholas, I think offering some of the best value in the higher end red blend market in South Africa at the moment, Optima from the Antoine Rupert range, doing much the same. So I've got a lot of wine to go and explore and a lot of time and energy to put into this particular task. So while I'm doing that, I've got some people for you to catch up with. A little later on, I'm going to meet up with Bevan Newton-Johnson from the Newton-Johnson family vineyards in the Hamelanada Valley, who've got a history of making some terrific Chardonnay and some terrific Pinot Noir. I sat down with him at one of my favorite restaurants in Johannesburg, the Short Market Club, to taste some new releases and to drink some wonderful wine with him. And I'll be doing that just a little later on in the show. But first up, it's at Glenelli and the chance to catch up with Luca Cunningham before he goes, because the winemaker who's done 14 years at the estate in Stellenbosch is on his way to Bergerlirchen to take up a new role. He's very excited, Bergerlirchen are very excited. And while I know Glenelli were very sad to see him go, he leaves behind a terrific legacy. And as you can see, it's an estate that will always be close to his heart. If there is a challenge to doing what I do, which is the enormously hard work of traversing the winelands, drinking exceptional wine, and meeting enormously cool people in great spots, it's finding new ways to talk about this succession of places that are just so beautiful. It is a hallmark of the winelands, and whenever you go around the world, there are very few places that for sheer scale of beauty, of hospitality, of quality of wine, and of just general experience, that can touch Stellenbosch. And I'm afraid I'm stuck in yet another one of them today. It's a place I've been to on a number of occasions. It is home to wine that I've drunk on many occasions. And today, it's a chance to catch up with a guy called Luke, who makes that rather nice wine. Luke, <laughs> thanks Cheers. for having me. Uh, thank you for coming around. It's great having the team here. I've got to ask, I was born in Belfast. I have a suspicion we might be like seventh cousins because the surname sounds suspiciously Irish. It is Irish and you'll probably be closer than that because <laughs> the roots of the family do track all the way back to Belfast. Although my father uh, grew up down in Southern Ireland, uh, I always consider him as a really as a Dubliner because he was sent to uh, Castlenock boarding school from about the age of six and that's where he grew up but um, yeah Ireland is our home I suppose our interest, ancestral home although uh, we can really trace the family origins so far back into Scottish times and that's why our surname O'Quinnigan it's Gaelic for actually Cunningham and that's where it comes from. So Irish roots with a touch of Scottish, let's call it Celtic and make it nice and easy. <laughs> yeah. From my time in Ireland and Scotland, I felt I spent a fair amount of time in both. I haven't come across a huge number of wine estates. So uh, how does an O'Cunnigan come into the world of wine? Well, it was a touch and go. I mean, um, my family is pretty much uh, a medical family. My, both my parents were in the medical field, my brother's uh, in uh, medicine as well. And I was first venturing off to go and study veterinary science. And my dad convinced me to first, before going up to Honest Deport, come and do a, a BSc at uh, Stellenbosch. And I think that was a big mistake because <laughs> then I discovered the, the world of wine and growing up uh, in the Constantia region in uh, in Cape Town, 
I'd always grown up around the vineyards and then I started to get a real passion for them and uh, take it forward. And growing up, my brother was uh, best mates with a, a now very famous South African winemaker, Adi Bardenost. And so when I came through to uh, university, I started working at Rustenburg Wines and Adi was a winemaker there. And that's what really perked my interest and caused me to change across into studying viticulture and onology instead of going on the veterinary route. Uh, what for you is the, the real joy, the real reward of being a winemaker? I think it's the fact that you can, uh, you're working with your hands to produce something, but it's seeing the pleasure that it gives other people. And I love listening to the way people describe wines and what they personally find in it. I know for myself, when I drink a lot of wine, a lot of the aromatics or flavors take me back off into childhood. Um, and for me, it certainly brings back very fond memories when I'm drinking interesting wines and you think back and it sparks these memories. You've had many of them. You've made many wines and Glenelli's got a, a very warm place in the hearts of many wine drinkers <laughs> in South Africa. You're only part of the story though, because there is also uh, an elderly French woman who's uh, fairly crucial to Glenelli's existence. <laughs> Well, I have to, I owe her a tremendous amount, her name being uh, Mae de Lancasa. And uh, I suppose not many people at the age of 78 think they need a new challenge in their life. And she decided at that age to sell everything up in France. And she owned a number of famous uh, Bordeaux chateaus, the jewel in the crown being Chateau Pichon Comtesse de Lalante. And she decided to venture out here and uh, start a new farm from scratch. Um, I think one of the driving factors for her coming out here is that in Bordeaux, you have all the Bordeaux legislation, which um, it's quite rigid. And coming out to South Africa gave her a blank canvas that she could experiment and uh, express herself with different things. For instance, we produce Chardonnay on the property here, and that's not uh, Bordeaux varietal. Uh, you typically only see Sauvignon Blanc in Bordeaux. But growing up, she had always grown up with her uncles, and her uncles felt that it was vital for her to be engaged with other parts of the industry rather than Bordeaux. So they always used to uh, show her Burgundian varieties or Rhone varieties, and that's where her passion for Chardonnay came. Um, so coming to South Africa gave her the opportunity to express it. It's a, a terrific, terrific story. How long ago was that? And is she still a, a driving force behind Glenelli? Well, she's still very much a driving force at uh, 96 years of age. <laughs> and um, I often wonder, then whether it's going back to Scottish and Irish roots, whether it's the double-fingered scotch that she has every night or the, the wine that keeps her going. But um, she's very active in the business still, which is incredible. And it uh, gives us a lot of inspiration that somebody of her age still has this amount of energy to continue. Um, so I think her vision for this whole area has been for her grandkids to take it forward. And uh, I think it's one of the advantages of, for me, certainly working for a lady like this, is that her family has been continuous witness since 1783. So they know this game. They know it's a long-term game. So uh, her whole view was we in here for the long term and going to see it forward. She sounds like an extraordinary woman. She's someone I hope I get the chance to meet one day because her <laughs> contribution to the whole wine industry has been immense. She's celebrated in many ways, but in this particular instance, celebrated in a bottle of wine. You must have had to pull out something quite special to pay tribute to Lady May. Well, this uh, wine that we're drinking, the Lady May, really goes back to when I first started working uh, here. I flew to Bordeaux to go and meet uh, Madame de Lancazar. And when I arrived at her house, uh, she said, I've got something special for us to drink tonight. And I'd love you to use it as a, a benchmark and strive to achieve one day at uh, Glen Ely. And I thought if I was really lucky, I'd have one of the great vintages of Bordeaux, like a 1961, or if I was really, really lucky from the late 40s. But when I came downstairs and poked my head around the corner, waiting for me on the table that night was a, 
1873 Lafitte Rothschild. Oh. And <laughs> <laughs> what was incredible is a wine that was well over 100 years of age still had so much uh, character about it, finesse, texture, everything that you expect from a wine. And it was amazing. You always hear people to say about how wine is a living entity, but it was incredible to see how something had lasted that length of time. Um, so it was, this is a, really our first tentative steps to get a wine in that sort of direction that's going to reward you with um, longevity if you're patient with it. Um, it's based, I suppose, on uh, the Bordeaux origins um, because it's typically looking more of like a left bank sort of blend, which is a, a Cabernet based blend with some Merlot and uh, Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot in it. But it's all about texture, finesse, um, yeah, and ageability, I, I suppose, is the key for us. Well, with ageability, based on what this is aspiring to, you drank yours, 1873, what, about 120 years old? So we should be drinking this in about, what, 2135? <laughs> I wish we could get that length out of it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have my maiden sip because I cannot hold myself back any longer. Uh, what am I jumping into here? What am I expecting? So it will be very deep and dark and brooding um, uh, fruits coming through. Uh, this is from the 2015 vintage. So I'm very fortunate that Madame has allowed us to do part of the aging for a lot of people before we release the wine to start to get it into a, a point of drinking. Um, but it's a wine that's very rich, got a lot of density to it. Um, and there's a lot of cassis and blackberries that come through on it as well. So. That dark and moody expression is brilliant. It does okay. capture it perfectly. It's, uh, it's in a bad mood, it puts you in a good mood. It's a, <laughs> a nice exactly. transition. It's, so. um, it's a wine that I would drink on its own very happily, but I'd also quite like to pair it with some food. And that's something that we can do here because uh, I think when we're wrapped up, we might be heading upstairs. It is one of the other ch chief attractions here at Clavelli. You've got a, a great little restaurant, a terrific chef, and some decent views as well. <laughs> we do, we're very fortunate that we've got uh, Chef Christophe de Hoss that uh, works with us. And, and Christophe, um, he's got a, a unbelievable understanding of food and wine pairings. He's so passionate about what he does and what the what the team up there do and uh, I think the foods that they produce are truly exceptional and what I particularly like it puts me in a difficult spot often is that he changes the menu pretty much every week and so often I take clients and we sit down and they'll say what do you recommend on the list and I go I've never eaten any of this before <laughs> and it's a bit embarrassing but it's fantastic that he is so creative like that and and uh, he's very strong with the classic dishes, which uh, is something that I enjoy and the family enjoys as well. And it speaks to this sense of history that Lady May has permeated exactly. into Glen Alley. Two things to do then. One is to say goodbye, because Luke and I are gonna go up and lay siege to the menu and see how well it goes with the wine. <laughs> and the other is to please take out your diary and make a note in it. You'll need to pass it on because 2142, my great-grandchildren will be sitting down with Luke's great-grandchildren and seeing how this wine is shaping up. Well, the wines of Glenelli, thank you, Luke. What a fabulous place to make wine. And I love that French backstory to Glenelli. Really does add to the allure of the place. And now, while well, you've been watching that, I've been scratching my head, trying to work out exactly what Sauvignon Blanc to take over to the tail end of the European summer. It's going to be warm. I want something crisp and fresh. We've got some terrific Sauvignon Blanc, but what to take if I can only fit in one bottle? Do I go out to the Durbanville area, uh, something like this De Grendel, or, or maybe try some Dirmersdal, who makes so many great examples? Uh, do I head to Constantia, Klein Constantia, Hurt Constantia, Sternberg, so many estates that have written the book on making South African Sauvignon Blanc. 
or do I go for this, which is a bit of a sleeper hit, I think. This is Friars Cove, recently acquired by the team at DGB. They're putting a lot of money and time into it. They've got a wonderful winemaker in Lisa Godwin, who came over from Mirandal in Durbanville. And just that fresh sea breeze, the cold sea water. It's four hours from Cape Town. It's the middle of nowhere, but it's going to be very firmly on the map for Sauvignon Blanc very soon. Get this while you still can. All right, while I settle on a final decision, let's head over to the Short Market Club where Bevan Newton Johnson, whose brother Gordon is the current chair of the Winemakers Guild and together with his wife Nadia makes the wine, has got a selection for me to sample in one of my favorite restaurants. Welcome to a little slice of Rosebank that is fast becoming the hottest restaurant area in the city. To my left, I have the Short Market Club, just over my right shoulder, also by Luke Del Roberts, the Test Kitchen Carbon, the reincarnation in both instances of what had become hallmarks of the Cape Town culinary scene, now transplanted with a few tweaks up to Johannesburg. And also up to Johannesburg from the Cape, albeit a little farther afield, one of my favorite people in the wine industry, the unofficial mayor of the Hemelanada Valley, Bevan Newton Johnson. Good to see you. See you, Dan. And uh, geez, so you're wearing shoes, they're trousers, a long sleeved mm -hmm. shirt. I had to look twice. My wife had to get me dressed this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to have you up in an estate which I, I've got so many good memories of. Probably the best one is meeting you for the epic mm. at about 8.30 in the morning mm. and you serving up a full flight of Chardonnay for breakfast mm. uh, but apologizing because you'd forgotten any food. I stalled you from 8.30. I gave you your first glass at 9. <laughs> <laughs> it was a wonderful morning. It was a wonderful morning for two reasons. Uh, the company was obviously fantastic but also the chance to, to drink this wonderful wine that you guys continue to make and that you have a, a lot of fun making. We're going to try some in just a moment. Uh, take me back though to the Newton Johnson family because it was your parents where this all kicked off. Yeah, no, very much. So we grew up in Stellenbosch uh, in the wine industry in the 80s, but very more on the sort of corporate side, my dad was. And um, it makes me really appreciate now how sort of small the industry was then. Uh, Table Friends was Dave Hughes or Alan Mullins, uh, Jan Boelan Kutsia, Giles Webb, Kevin Arnold to realize how all of those Neil Ellis have all gone out into the industry and, you know, sort of forged their, their own ways. And so for us, my father was like, we're going to move to Amanus. And it was a kind of joke, the deadliest. I was a student at the time. Amanus was our drinking spot. You only remember Amanus twice when you drove in and when you left. So first thought when dad said, let's move there, I was like, I don't think I could drink that much. But we've been there for 25 years now. And it's a, a, a generational uh, entity because it is now not just you and your brother, uh, but there is also Nadia, Gordon's mm -hmm. wife, which leads me to a two-part question. Uh, Gordon and Nadia are the winemakers together. Who of Gordon and Nadia is the better winemaker and why do you say Nadia? Sure. Nadia is the only qualified winemaker in the family. <laughs> so there we've got that one. And I think she's the more responsible one, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's amazing. I mean, out of the family, actually, I was the only one that didn't work with my wife. You know, my parents worked together, Gordon and Nadia, exceptionally well. And uh, yeah, they both take a very different viewpoint, thankfully, of the same glass of wine. And both complement complement each other in an exceptional way. Gordy is the creativity, it's a little bit of our X factor, but he needs grounding. He needs, you know, that, that, that. and that's Nadia. She, she brings all of that behind him. And an immense amount of confidence for him. So I don't know if you'd ever be able to contemplate it without her. Yeah, so. I think it's, it's a terrific team and you complete a triumvirate that has taken Newton Johnson to, to great heights because it has become a, a really established, a really celebrated brand in South Africa. And for me, what makes it really cool is the fact that you're, you're quite site specific. You know what's on the farm, you know what works. And as a result, it's not just we have a Pinot Noir, we have a Chardonnay. You've got a number of different interpretations that pay tribute to the opportunities you have at Newton Johnson. Yeah, I mean, it's been an interesting experience. And I mean, to say the least in a certain way, I mean, we bought a blank canvas and to see how the properties unfolded in front of us. And I always kind of jokingly say that terroir was something you read in a magazine article about someone else's farm. and. We've seen that now starting to unfold in front of us. 
And thankfully, again, being led by Gordy and Nadia, it's just how these sites and soils have opened themselves up to what we're doing. And I think you have to be receptive to that. And they have been, and it's been amazing to follow. I've always been sort of say the first line of concern spectators and get to taste them from the cellar, from the barrel. But it's been an amazing journey. And for one, that we have to kind of pinch ourselves every now and again. Um, if I can say respectfully, there's lots more that we can accomplish. Yet, though, if we look back, we've achieved so many fairy tales that we never really thought that we would ever be able to achieve. So we're immensely proud, very happy with what's happened. But I think if we kind of behave ourselves, there's so much more that the vineyards can give us. The breadth of what you do uh, goes beyond the, the normal image people have of the Hemelanada Valley. This is Burgundy and South Africa. It is Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. You do those, both of those terrifically. And we're going to try some Chardonnay in a moment. Uh, but just as Restless River have shot to fame with a Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm. And uh, I've lost count of all the things JC is doing for creation. Uh, so you guys have a, a number of different wines. In particular, uh, your Albarino, which in an admittedly small field, I think is South Africa's finest. Uh, but you have that element of Hemelanada where you're not just restricted to the poster boys everyone's expecting. Yeah, I mean, it was actually a while ago, we as a family went up to Citrus Dahl, to the warm baths, and I took a, a drive along the scurf path and just looked at like how Yibin works from vineyards there, Fairview works with vineyards there, Neil Ellis, uh, Chris Allight, um, Donovan Ra, and, and just to think that 15 years before, it was such an uncelebrated part of our world. And then on the drive back to Amanus, go past Ulifansberg in near Slanguk. And it's a bit, I think, wild to say that there are no boundaries, but there's a lot more that we can discover. It was actually my father who brought up Albarino. I needed to go and Google it to figure out what it was when he mentioned it. And it has. It's actually farming with uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay has not been fun. It's, it's the school of hard knocks. But Albarino has been a, a breath of fresh air. And it's it's one of, if I can say, pure innocence, because we've got no one to compare to. It's one that we've just got to literally let the, the vineyard and the, the grapes lead us. And it's been very rewarding. It's been a lot of fun to pour that wine and to get people's reaction on it. So, yeah, it's been fun. And a lot of fun to drink it as well. Right? Yeah. It's a fair bit of that. We're not drinking that today. They were drinking something else. Uh, and this, again, might take people by surprise. Uh, I think we are growing in our understanding of the potential for white wine to last more than three days after it has been bottled. Um, but there's still people who uh, maybe have that view. And particularly, I suppose, with things like Sauvignon Blanc, but the aging potential of Chardonnay is extraordinary when well made. And that's exactly what you've given me here. Mm. Yeah, it was, again, amazing to be given this um, challenge by Strauss. And as I sort of said, it's it's one of where one of our last sort of bastions that will our last Rubicons to cross as a fine wine industry to really be able to cement how our wines show after a few years in the bottle. And we look around the world, we as South Africans want to be there with the best in the world. Um, we've got a few years, we're a bit younger than them, so we can steal with our eyes, we can learn, but also we've got to show who we are. And it, wine always comes down to track record. And so this is, starts to be shown that build up, that sort of hopefully intellectual property. And uh, it was surprising to us. I mean, there was a few things that we could do during lockdown and getting down into the older vintages was one of them, getting to look back a bit. Kind of always jokingly say that this must have been cowboy days for us then. And now this must be cowboy days in 10 years time. But um, yeah, you know, how we've learned along the way, but it's just amazing to see how the wines have shown themselves. As I taste it uh, with great excitement, uh, tell me what it is that allows this 10 years on to be as good as I know it will be. Yeah, this is 2013. Where were you in 2013? Mm. Finishing primary school. Okay, excellent. I wasn't very That's bright. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, for us, what was amazing again to look back, the celebrated vintages were 12 and 15, the warmer ones. And now, again, the little bit of a lesson we can learn and being able to look back is how the cooler vintages like 13 and 14 show themselves far more subtly and elegantly, which is some of the words and some of the, the characters we'd love to see in our wines developing into the future. So it's amazing to see how the younger uh, vintages show well through the warmer side. And then the cooler ones allow themselves a few years to really bring out their true beauty. And again, this is only something we can learn by looking back, even ourselves, you know. And uh, it's been amazing to see how the 13th showing. It is so fresh and so alive for a mm. wine that's almost a decade on. Uh, I 
I would I would not have come close to saying that this is quite as old as it was if I was tasting it first up, which leads to one final question. It is nine years going on 10, 19 years going on 20, still drinking? Sure. I don't know, you test me. I mean, I'm blind, so I've only got a short-term memory. Um, yeah, I would love to say that this is going to be happy for another five years. That's me being conservative. It'll be amazing to see how these wines go six to eight years on from now. Um, we've got a 2020 indoors today to try a little bit later. And there I'd also like to say that I think a little bit of what we're building in with older vineyards, again, a little bit more of that intellectual property in the vineyards themselves. I think we're going to see wines that are going to be happy to age for 20 years into the future. I'd love to have the same conversation about Pinot Noir because I had some 10 year old Pinot Noir from Radford Dale the other day out of the mm. Elgin Vineyard and it was singing quite delightfully. But we're going to have to leave that for another time, possibly on my next surf trip down to the Himalayana Valley. We can go and hit some waves and uh, try got, some wine. Got all your equipment waiting for you. Your quiver is there. You just take your choice. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Look like his brother Gordon. They're only making wine under duress. They'd like to be surfing 10 hours a day. Uh, but when they're not on the boards, they're making some terrific wine, marketing some terrific wine, and telling some great wine stories of a family that's been a big part of putting the Hemelanada Valley on the world map. Not for the first time a member of the South African wine community who'd far rather be surfing than making or selling wine. He does a pretty good job of convincing you he's got some good stuff. Well, he doesn't need that much convincing because one glass of the Newton Johnson Pinot Noir or Chardonnay makes you a very, very happy person. Also look out for their Albarino, I think the best of the grape we have in South Africa. My shopping is almost complete. I've still got a few last decisions to make, but I have settled on one of them. I found some Luddite Shiraz from 2017. We know what a great vintage 2017 was, uh, even up in Botrafir, where Niels and his team have added to the legacy of this very firm favorite in the Shiraz stake. So that'll be in the suitcase to Europe heading off tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. Big thank you to Luke and the team at Glenelli for an introduction to an estate with a wonderful French twist. And if you've got a chance, nip down to your local pick and pay over the next little while. I think you might be surprised by the range and quality of wine that is up on offer. If they've got the Luddite Shiraz, it can't be too bad at all. Cheers.